come a long way from that small town in Illinois, Dixon, and the protective warmth of your mother, Nell. What's your earliest memory of your mother's influence on you and what she taught you to do that really shaped your life? Well, she, of course, was a major part. I had a brother a couple of years older than I am, four in our family, the two of us, and mother and father. And uh, she was probably the kindest human being I've ever known. Now, looking back, I know that we live in poverty or pretty close to it all the time. But we didn't know that at the time because the government didn't come around and tell us we were poor. And uh, she was always finding someone worse off uh, that we would help. And I remember that about her, uh, this kindliness and all. And yet at the same time, she could be firm, like the time in an even smaller town where I was born, Tampico, Illinois, 800 people. And we lived across a little park from the railroad station. And in those days, the biggest treat wasn't the ice cream wagon coming around. It was the ice wagon. And kids would get chips of ice from the ice man that was chipping the pieces out to put in the ice boxes along the way. And the ice wagon had pulled up over there, and my brother and I saw it. And he, being the older, took the lead. And we started across the little park. But a train pulled in between us and the ice wagon. And my mother came out on the porch just in time to see us get down and crawl under the train to get to the other side. And we were barely through and at the ice wagon when the train pulled out. She met us in the middle of that little park. And uh, we felt a very firm hand, <laughs> both of us, <laughs> applied <laughs> along about midway in our backs. Did she teach you other things as well, like how to read and how to get on in life, about the values of life? Oh, well, she, yes. She was always talking about things like that, but making great sense with them. But the, with regard to the reading, um, I don't know that she was aware that she was teaching us, but when we were very young, and at that point we lived in Galesburg in a rented house there. My father was traveling around looking for better jobs. And uh, she would read to my brother and me when we went to bed. She'd get between us on the bed and read the, the bedtime story. But she always did it in holding the book and running her finger under the line she was reading. And the two of us were there, and we could watch, and we could at the same time hear, of course. Now, I don't know whether she was doing that deliberately, and I have no recollection of ever learning to read. But I was one night, when I was five years old, I was lying on the living room floor with a newspaper, and my father came in, and he said, what are you doing? And I said, we're reading the paper. And he thought I was being smart, Alec. And he said, well, go ahead, read me something. And I did. And the next thing I knew, he was out on the front porch yelling for the neighbors. And he brought the neighbors in and made me read for them because there was no kindergarten. I had never been any place but at home at that time, a year away from starting regular school. But uh, yes, I was reading the paper. Your mother had very strong religious values as well. Yes. She believed in the power of prayer, for example. You believe in the power of prayer. Yes. Can you recall incidents in your life when you have prayed and God has answered your prayer almost in a specific way? Yes, I think I can. And uh, I believe very much in what Abraham Lincoln said when he had this job. He said he couldn't perform the functions, the duties of this job for 15 minutes if he didn't know that he could call upon one who was wiser and stronger than all others. But in that connection, I think my mother, a lesson that was hammered over and over again, and as I grew up, I really began to realize. And that is, when there was a great disappointment, something went wrong, she would say to us, look, just everything happens for a reason and for the best. Now, she said, you may feel bad about this right now, but down the road, something will happen good and you will, in appreciating that, look back and say, if this, if that hadn't happened, that supposed bad thing, this good thing would not have happened. And I had a classic example in my growing up. I'd graduated from college in 1932. I was hitchhiking around. I'd set my mind on a career in the entertainment world. So I thought it starting, if I could ever get in and be a sports announcer, would be 
radio was pretty new in those days. And uh, finally, I was disappointed. I had had advice to just try to get a job in a station, never mind what you wanted to do, and then take your chances on moving on from there. But I couldn't, and a very wise woman in a major station in Chicago told me that I was going at it the wrong way. I shouldn't be trying for those big stations where they couldn't afford to hire inexperience. Go out there into the smaller stations. Well, I hitchhiked home and arrived and was told that a Montgomery Ward store had opened in Dixon and they had a sporting goods department. And they were looking for someone that was kind of well known in the town for his high school athletics there and so forth to head up that department. Well, I went down and applied. And I didn't get the job. A fellow a couple of years after me in high school, uh, been quite a basketball sensation, he got the job. I was pretty disappointed. My father loaned me the car. I'd told him all the things that I'd been doing, a family car, and I drove 75 miles in my disappointment down to the Tri-Cities, Rock Island and Moline and Davenport, Iowa. And there in a station in Davenport, Iowa, I met a program director who he still couldn't use me. And, uh, but where was I? Because they had just hired an announcer a few days before. And I didn't tell him I didn't listen to his station. But on the way out, talking all to myself, really, I said, how do you ever get to be a sports announcer if you can't get a job in a radio station? And went on down the hall, and pretty soon I heard a clumping. He was very badly crippled with arthritis and had two canes. And he was yelling out, you big so-and-so, wait. And he caught up with me. The elevator wasn't there yet. And he said, what was that you said about sports? And I said, well, that's what I'd like to be. Well, he said, you know anything about football? And I said, I played it for eight years. He said, could you tell me about a football game? And if I was at home listening to the radio, make me see it? And I said, I think so. He took me in a studio, stood me in front of a microphone. And he said, now, when the red light goes on, I'll be in another room listening. You start broadcasting an imaginary football game. Well, I stood there waiting for the light, and I knew I had to have names. And I remembered the year before, that previous fall, my senior year, playing in a game, Eureka, when we went 65 yards on the last play for the winning touchdown. And it was the last play of the game. And I knew all our players' names, and I knew enough of the opponents' names that I figured I could do. So I started in the fourth quarter. And I had the long blue shadows settling over the field and the real wind coming in through the end of the stadium. We didn't have a stadium, we had bleachers. And uh, then I ran a few plays and finally I came up to the big play and I had this and did the big play and made the touchdown with only 20, the play with only 20 seconds to go and so forth. And then I grabbed the microphone and said, that's all. He came in and said, be here Saturday. I'll give you $5 and car fare you are broadcasting the Iowa-Minnesota game for us. Do you think that if Montgomery Wards had hired you for the sports department? I might still be there working in Montgomery Wards. And not President of the United States? <laughs> well, uh, all the things in between that resulted in this wouldn't have happened. You and I come from similar roots. I grew up in a small towns of the Midwest as well, and life has changed for both of us, obviously. On many of the grand occasions that I've been privileged to be a part of, I've often thought back to my roots to particular friends or incidents in my life, and I've wondered what they were like. Does that happen to you when you're at a state dinner or at the Kremlin or when you're presiding at some ceremony, for example, in Normandy? Does Dixon flash through your mind in those days? Oh, there are things. Uh, I think it takes reminders in so far removed in that way of life and, and this one. But there are reminders every once in a while that just like this one that at length I gave you that, uh, that you'll think back and say, hey, this maybe had a, a beginning there. You went from Dixon to Eureka College and you studied economics among other things. You reminded your advisors of that from time to time. What have you remembered from your Eureka economics courses that have helped you in dealing with the national economy? Well, I, was, I majored in economics and sociology. They were combined, so it was a single major. But then you were really studying at a time when life was in the raw. This was the depths of the Depression. We had a professor, a wonderful old fellow, Daddy Gray, and um, he used to give us outside reading, books by economists to read. And then we'd come in with a book report and so forth, and then we'd discuss it. 
And I can remember him. He had a sense of humor also. There we were in the depths of the Depression, a book by a noted economist. And when we'd finished reporting and everything, just as the class was concluding, he'd say, uh, it's interesting to note that the author of this book, five weeks before the crash, said he saw no reason why stocks should not continue to rise indefinitely. Well, uh, <laughs> that set you a little straight, but uh, Did it yes. make you suspicious of economists forevermore after that? <laughs> well, no, but the, the, uh, the thing that, as I say, at that time, you were really studying in a classic example of economics and what was going to happen. This was prior to the election of, of uh, FDR and all of the recessions we've had since. No one who didn't go through the through the re depression can ever visualize what it was like. 26 percent unemployment nationwide. The government going on radio with announcements, don't leave home looking for a job, there are none. Well, there were no government programs at that time to take care of, of uh, the people that suddenly were just destitute. My father from managing a, a shoe store uh, with a kind of work uh, a partnership uh, in the ownership was out. The shoe store was gone. And this was happening in little towns like Dixon as well as in the great cities. The National Guard in Illinois was mobilized and sent to parade in Chicago simply because there were so many people living in doorways on the streets by that time in the streets just off Michigan Boulevard that there was real concern about uh, rioting and, and so forth. And they just did that as a show of strength. There are still people in this country now who are homeless, who are still struggling economically and so on. And for some of them, it's a kind of continuation of the Depression. Is there a parallel between what's going on for some families in this country now and what happened then in your mind? Well, there may be some, because there are a few spots in the country where due to a change in industry and so forth, the principal industries in those communities uh, are gone. And it's a case of either move or bring a new industry into the community and so forth. So there are a few trouble spots. But basically, as you know, 19 million new jobs have been created. And the largest percentage of those has gone to the people most in need. And they are better jobs than ever before. And over 90% of them are full-time, not part-time jobs. So it isn't a situation comparable to that. And I think that you have to recognize that some of the people on the street have chosen that. Because right here in Washington, shelters, both private and public, that have been opened for those people have space in them and people that can go there and won't prefer to be out there on the grates and so forth. And uh, whatever their reason is, just remember that recently in New York, a young lady took a case to court to force them under her constitutional right to let her go back and live in that cardboard box out on the street. Mr. President, let me ask you about your Hollywood career. You went from a good job in Des Moines, Iowa as a radio broadcaster in the height of the Depression to Hollywood where you were making, what, $200 a week, I think, as a contract player at Warner Brothers? Yes. Did you begin to think about that time, gee, maybe there's a lucky star that's kind of hovering over Ronald Reagan, that luck is going to be a part of your life in some fashion? Well, whether I called it luck or whether I called it answer to prayers, I, I realized that I was very blessed. And uh, that's why I thought that also uh, and for those blessings, uh, I kind of, uh, I ought to pay my way by doing whatever I could in return for others. We're all starstruck in this society a little bit. Uh, when you arrived in Hollywood, who were the big stars that you remember seeing that really made an impression on you? That oh, well, this was in the wonderful era of Hollywood that exists no more. The era when the seven major studios all had their list of contract players and stars. Their directors were under contract, the producers and writers. It was like a family in the studio. And at Warner Brothers, there was uh, Jimmy Cagney and Pat O'Brien and uh, uh, Betty Davis and Wayne Morris had just become a young s new star there on, for, for Kid Galahad that he'd made. But, uh, and, and Dick Powell and Jack Carson and well, you can go along with the, uh, with the 
trying to think of them all at the same time, but you'd eat there in the commissary at lunch and they were all around you and be at your same table with you. And uh, It was a, a wonderful time, but also you uh, were made to realize you, you were under contract now. They took me in and sat me down and it was as if I couldn't hear because they were all talking about me in front of me and they were trying to decide on a name for me. I'd always used my kid nickname Dutch when I was a sports announcer, Dutch Reagan. And uh, they were talking and talking and finally I was getting a little uncomfortable and finally I said to them, because uh, that was a pretty big radio station by then, I said, look, uh, you know, uh, my name's rather well known in a large section of the country. Uh, do you think we just uh, toss it off? And they said, Dutch Reagan? And I said, well, <clears throat> my real name is Ronald Reagan. I'd never used the Ronald. I liked Dutch better. And uh, they said, Ronald, Ronald Reagan, Ronald. Hey, that's not bad. I got to keep my own name, Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Who were the actresses that you liked playing with in those days, starring with in films that uh, you remember? Oh, oh, my goodness, the Lane sisters had just come on big in pictures, Priscilla Lane. Uh, I was in a picture with Betty Davis, and it was a wonderful experience. She was such a great actress. Uh, and it was Jane Bryant. Uh, oh, good Lord. I'm forgetting some of the names. What about uh, Ann Sheridan? Ann Sheridan, oh, yes. Uh, you pictured with Ann Sheridan, and she was, she was a great gal. Just wonderful. You watch films I know now. You know who the contemporary film stars are. It's very possible that they're going to make the story of Ronald Reagan. Now, if you could cast that story of Ronald Reagan, who would you like to play the part of you? I'd rather they didn't make the story. <laughs> if I can't play it, I don't know that I want to recommend anyone else. Do you like current film stars? Do you have some favorites among the, the current uh, crop well, of stars? The, I'll tell you, the lack of continued publicity as we had when the fan magazines existed and everything, and each studio had a publicity department with men that were assigned to a group of performers there to see that their names were constantly before the public. That doesn't exist anymore. And I find a great difficulty in remembering the names. I'll see a face on the screen and say, oh yeah, I remember, saw them in another picture. But uh, the names just don't, don't linger. You recently talked in your uh, farewell address to the nation about films that had strong moral values and celebrated American patriotism. What are some of those films that you remember that did that? Oh my. Well, if you remember, constantly uh, there, were, uh, there were movies that were made, I uh, can't remember titles, but movies that were made, say, about West Point or Annapolis. And uh, movies of that kind that the plot took place in the story with, with regard to cadets that uh, were there in, the, in those schools. And then there were, of course, the service pictures. That, and when the war came, war pictures that uh, were built and based on patriotism and so forth and, and were pretty factual in their portrayal of those, uh, of those times. Uh, yes, I think there was a, a great thought in, in Hollywood to, to make pictures that tied in to the things that people understood and knew. Mr. President, you also said in that uh, farewell speech that you directed American children to sit down with their parents and talk about what America stands for and what there is to celebrate in this country. If you could lead that kind of a discussion at a dinner table, who would be the people in your lifetime that you would put forward as the patriots, the kind of model Americans who would serve to inspire coming generations? Oh, well, I think there are any, any number. You could start with uh, our people that go abroad in the, in the, or go out into space in the shuttle. But you could come back to the heroes of our time. And, uh, but I think also it's more general than that. that. That I remember as a little kid, you knew that when the flag went by, you were to stand up and put your hand in your heart. You knew that you were to stand and sing the national anthem. And you learned to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. And you also, history was required. And therefore, you knew the beginnings of this country. And you knew the names of the, the great patriots and who a George Washington was, but, but all the others. And I don't think that's true today. So often, 
Well, when, and I won't name the university, don't want to embarrass anyone, but when not too long ago, uh, third year students, juniors, in one of our large universities couldn't tell anyone which side in World War II Hitler was on. Now, is there anything wrong with thinking that history, not with regard to whether it's going to help you make a living or anything of that kind, but that everyone should know the background and the history of their country, how it came to be, and thus what our citizens' responsibilities are. Isn't it a little shameful that in this country, which had to fight for the independence of we, the people, is now smaller and smaller, are growing the number of people who bother to vote. How does anyone have the nerve to complain about any level of government if they didn't go to the polls? Will Rogers once said that people elected to public office are no better and no worse than the people who send them there, but they're all better than those who don't vote at all. Mr. President, you've had such an extraordinary life starting, as I say, from that small town in Dixon, Illinois, when you were coming of age, uh, working class family there. Uh, you've risen to these great heights of being President of the United States. You leave office with the goodwill of the American people behind you. What's the difference between being in this kind of a position, a member of the haves, I suppose is the best way to describe it in American life, and the earlier days of your life when you were a member of the have-nots? Well, again, as I say, I recognize that uh, for whatever reason, I have been blessed. And uh, never a day goes by that I don't say a thanks for that blessing. And uh, also, I ask that I be given the wisdom to do something uh, to show my, my thanks for that, that blessing. I'm going to just pause here for a minute because I want to, there are a couple of things that we haven't been able to get to that I would like to get back to in the anecdotal stuff. I know that, yeah, okay, if we can just, if we can agree on that, we'll be all right, okay. I want to, okay. Mr. President, you had a very strong relationship with someone named Margaret Cleaver. Yes. You were all but engaged to her. Was engaged. I hung my fraternity pin on her. You talked about your future together, probably. Well, yes. She was the daughter of the minister of our church. And uh, I knew that she was going to Eureka College, and uh, it wasn't really that I made the decision then to go there. I'd already made that when I was much younger. My biggest hero happened to be the son of the then minister of the church, and he was a great high school football star. And as a kid, I saw him and thought he was great, and he went to Eureka and played football there. Uh, he later, for a time, I, I think, was uh, the chaplain at Yale University. But um, yes, we went together in high school, um, Eureka College. Uh, before we got out of college, why that was, I don't know whether it still exists today, but yes, engagement, you buy rings, you put your fraternity pin on her. How did you think that your life together would take shape? I mean, what, did you, what were your hopes then when you were well, going with Margaret Cleaver? Well, I knew that from my own background and so forth, I knew that I had to achieve a certain level of income before could contemplate marriage. But I think that's the thing that, uh, our romance didn't survive. She became a school teacher, and I was way over in Iowa there as a uh, sports announcer, and a long separation. There wasn't chance or possibility of visiting uh, each other frequently. And uh, then one day, uh, I received a notice that she uh, was engaged in marrying someone else. She broke it off. You didn't break it off. No and uh, a former teacher in high school of mine, one, that kind of teacher that every student has that you remember through your life, he wrote me a letter. He had also seen what had happened, and he wrote me a letter telling me uh, 
how I was to react and that I was to do any foolish things like uh, going off the deep end or anything. And uh, I remembered him, but uh, again, it must have been one of those things that uh, the disappointment that now you look back on and say, well, if that had happened, what, what I have now might not have happened. There's a celebrated story in your years at your Eureka College about one of your college uh, football teammates, William Burkhart, was a black member of the team. Yes. And he couldn't get into a hotel where the whole team was supposed to stay, so you took him to your home in Dixon, Illinois, where he was immediately put up with another black teammate. People who look at that story say, well, Ronald Reagan seemed to be more sensitive about those kinds of things then than he has been as the President of the United States, and maybe it's because he bumped up against them in a first-hand way back in Eureka. That whole thing has been the hardest burden, I think, of all that I have borne here, is that idea that I am not as sensitive and that somehow I am discriminating and so forth. And it is not true. That household I was raised in, my mother and father, the thing my brother and I grew up knowing was that there was no greater sin than prejudice or discrimination. And this was back in the days when there was discrimination generally. and. Uh, in Eureka College, yes, what happened was that we had to stay overnight in our hometown on a way, the bus load of players on a way to a, a Saturday game. And I took the coach in, introduced him to the manager of the hotel, and uh, he said that he would take everybody but those two. Well, our coach, Mac, he said, well, we'll sleep in the bus. And he turned to because the man had said also that no other hotel would either. There weren't many hotels in that little town. And we started out, and I told Mac, I said, we, we can't do that. I said, if they'll know what the reason is and be embarrassed. Well, he said, what can we do? When he had told me that I couldn't stay at home, even though I had a home there. And I said, well, why don't we just say there isn't enough room for everybody? And you put me in the two fellows in a cab and we'll go home. And even then, he, feeling as upset as he, he did, he said, Are you sure you, you want to do that? And I said, yes. I knew my home. No chance to call or anything. Home and rang the doorbell and Nellie came to the door. My brother and I decided to call our parents by their first name after we got to a certain age. Came to the door and I said, Nellie, there isn't enough room in the hotel for all of us. Can we put up here? Well. She never, of course you can put up here, and in we came. And uh, that, that wasn't unusual for the way I was raised or brought up at all. And I still feel the same way. As governor of California, I appointed more blacks to executive and, and policy-making positions than all the previous governors of California put together. When I ask you about your family, because it was such an important part of your early childhood. You didn't have a lot of money in that family. Your father, as you've written in your own book, uh, drank too much. Uh, he wasn't able to hold a job in a lot of different places. And yet you always stayed together as a family, even though there are big differences between you and your brother, Moon, for example, about how you see life and how you conduct yourselves. And here you are, the President of the United States, your financial future is secure, you've got a very good marriage, but within your own family now, there are these strains. Michael has written a book that has been critical of the way the family's been conducted. Patty and Mrs. Reagan are not talking. Is that just an affliction of modern life? Is that how we've changed in this country? Well, it might be. Uh, Patty now, we feel, and I, we haven't given up. Uh, but Patty uh, came up at that age when all the rioting was going on in the campuses, and if I went near one of them, they'd burn me in effigy. Uh, but no, the rest of the family, is united, and the book about that Mike, if you'd read it, it's a very unusual book. Mike was adopted, and this was a book about this. And so the first part of the book is his attitude, which he's now confessing to, but the last part of the book, it's almost as if it's by a different human being. Nancy was the one who told him how to find his real mother when he wanted to. And she was dead, but he found he has a, a brother. Uh, and so the, the last part of it, and we're as close as can possibly be 
Uh, and he is, I would recommend that book to anyone with adopted children. He was writing of the resentment that was within him about his situation. And it's a, it's a fascinating book. Mr. President, you're about to go off into retirement. Richard Nixon studies international affairs a lot these days. Uh, Gerald Ford works on this commission for the new presidency and plays a lot of golf and does a lot of speaking. Jimmy Carter pursues his interest at the Carter Library in, uh, in terms of the Middle East and the problems of the inner cities. Going up back out on the mashed potato circuit and trying to arouse the public to demand some changes, which it is their right to demand. The line item veto for a president the balanced budget amendment that most of the states have, but the federal government doesn't have. Thomas Jefferson called attention to that. And there are things that, uh, well, for example, the 22nd Amendment that was passed uh, by our own party here as revenge for Roosevelt that uh, says that two terms is the limit for a president. This is the only office that's elected by all the people. I think that is an infringement on the democratic rights of the people. And now that I'm out of office so that they can't accuse me of wanting to do it for myself, I'm going to see if I can't mobilize the people to demand the repeal of that amendment. It is an invasion of their democratic bite, wrote, or rights to vote for whoever they want to vote for and for however long. So we'll see a lot of Ronald Reagan speaking around the country? Yeah. And I mean, if you look. <laughs> Mr. President, as you look back on this extraordinary life that you've had, covering most of the 20th century in America, going from Dixon, Illinois, to the heights of power, President of the United States, what's the one thing that really sticks out in your mind about made the difference for you, made it possible? Well, I think maybe the teaching that I had and the faith that I had in prayer. And uh, I did it incidentally. We're, we're leaving out a lot of hometowns, you know. And when you mentioned my father's drinking, let me point out, he was an alcoholic. Yes, our family stayed together because my mother took the two of us aside, my brother and myself, and said, there will, you'll see things and sometimes your father, but you must not turn against him. He has a sickness and it's a sickness that we must try to help him with. It wasn't a case of just, you know, uh, a lush coming home. I've seen him go two or three years without a drink, but he was, in the classics, an alcoholic. And once that first drop went down, that's the thing with an alcoholic. They're no different than anyone else until they take that first drink. And then it would be a bender all the way to where he would be flat on his back and you call the doctor. Did that make you conscious of your own drinking habits? Uh, yes, yes, I think so. Uh, I've never felt any thing of that kind because it, it is an illness. And I can remember very much the, that there's, you know, doc, medicine can't explain it yet. Some want to look for a psycho, psychopathic or psycho, psychologic uh, reason. Others look for some physical. There has been one about shortage of sugar. I know that when in the, all the periods of soberness, my father was the biggest dessert eater I ever saw. <laughs> and in fact, uh, he wasn't above, and he did it good naturedly. He'd say, hey, what's that out the window? And if I'd look out the window, or my brother, would he take a spoonful of our dessert? <laughs> but was that the key, the family strength that you had when you look back over the last 50 years of your life? Yes, there, there was never a hint in our family that there could ever be a dissolution of the family. As a matter of fact, uh, we were even split religiously. My father was a Catholic and my mother was a Protestant, but uh, if we were to get any religion, it was to come from her because uh, for a period there, I think he gave up going to church for Lent. And, uh, but toward the end of his life, uh, he went back, he was in the church. And, and uh, no, it was, a, and uh, hometowns started with Tampico, then Chicago, then Galesburg, then Monmouth, Illinois, then back to Tampico, and then to Dixon. And it was about uh, eight or nine that I went to, years old that I went to Dixon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President.